Gordo. Welcome here at OBS. Uh, thank you for coming and just wanted to have a conversation ahead of two-year-old season in general and uh, talk about your experiences in Ocala. So tell us a little bit about your background and what initially got you into the thoroughbred industry. I probably didn't have a choice because um, I was born in Arcadia, California at the hospital that's on Santa Anita's grounds Very good. Uh, on Preakness Day. And my, my parents have been involved in it. And <clears throat> like most people, when you're young, your parents try to push you that way. And my parents didn't. My grandmother was kind of like, oh, you should like the horses more. I'm like, eh, no. And uh, when I was 13, uh, my father was a jocks agent. And he basically raised Pat Valenzuela, and Pat Valenzuela rode Sunday Silence in the 1989 Derby. And when they got home, that was it. I wanted to go go to work at the track. So I was actually supposed to go to work for Laz Barrera. And he was a very good friend of my father's. I called him Uncle Laz. And he passed away. So my mother had run Bobby Frankel's business from, you know, when I was in a bassinet till the day he passed away. And Humberto Escaño was the assistant. And he said, well, you're coming with us instead. So you're supposed to come with us anyway. So, okay. So I went to work when I was about 14. I have a special license. Um, I had a permit to work. And I used to take my first period at my high school as a work study. So, you know, like an internship or whatever. And I would go to the barn. And I always worked more than I was supposed to. And um, they didn't have a, the hours like, like they the do now. Like yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I was very lucky to get into it early. And once the bug bit me, it's, you know, stuck with me till today. Of course. So at 13, 14 years old, you knew you wanted to be in, but not particularly what area? Or did you kind of have to feel that out in the way? You know, the derby was this thing. Mm -hmm. And I was in my bedroom. My grandmother was watching me. And she's a big horse racing person. She kind of brought my mother and all my aunts around it. And um, my Aunt Ray made my first bet for me when I was five. My Aunt Patty, to this day, still follows all the horses. The derby, like, my grandma's watching me. And um, I go in a room, and you know, I don't know why I want to be by myself. No, I, to this day, no, no idea why. And uh, I watched it. Played my old Kentucky home, and I said, oh, you know, very emotional. When the horse won, that was it. I, I, it's that easy. That was it. I said, I want to do this. I just want to be around the horses. I, 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 like, I love the horses. I'm an animal person. The horses, to me, are, are the whole thing. And I, I couldn't put all that together at that age. But when I got around them, um, I like, you know, horses better than most people. I know, you know, so... <laughs> And, and then it blossomed from there. So as you work your way up through the ranks to become a professional like you are now, what were some of your favorite jobs st from starting at the track, you know, work on the backside to being on the front end for the business? You know, um, anybody that worked at the track, cleaning the gutter with the hose, you know, at, at the end of the morning to get all the dirt that was from where the wash racks are, something very therapeutic about that. Okay. Every once in a while when my wife trains, I'll go, to the barn, if I'm in a bad mood, I'll, I'll clean the gutters out. And it was like you could see the dirt going, you saw this thing going. So a non-horse related event, but I liked, you know, I was a hot walker. You start out, which is the bus boy of the horse world or the in the mail room, if you will. Um, and I used to always try to walk as many horses I can. I, I like set out to walk the most horses every day. I don't know why. Um, and then I learned to groom horses. I don't think I was the greatest groom that ever lived. But, uh, and then I worked my way up to a foreman and then an assistant. And you're directing the traffic, you know. And I got to write the set lists every day, which I enjoyed because you knew the horses. That was my first introduction to, to a lot of things. And when you're the foreman and you're organizing all this stuff, make sure the equipment's right and, you know, there was so much common sense involved. Uh, I think good horsemanship, it taught me about common sense that carries on into my everyday life. So what, going from the track to the sail ring, what was the, what was the path of that and what was your experience to get to? In the <clears throat> so um, my mother is a very good person with money and numbers and, and this business overall. And somewhere she handed me a checkbook. You know, the old-fashioned one. Balance it out. Yeah, that I, my daughter's 11. She'll think that's something from the National Archives if you showed it to her, you know. Um, I mean, it's not on my phone. Um, 
but I, I had a little blue checkbook from Bank of America, and she said, okay, um, you need to learn to manage money. So Jeannie Mayberry of the Ocala Mayberries now, um, who I have a long association with, Mrs. Mayberry, the matriarch, Jeannie, she would go and buy a couple horse for herself every year and pinhook them. So I took half of a horse for $10,000, which my mother financed, of course, and I learned to pay her back, and I learned about interest and all the things I deal with today. Um, and I owned half this horse with Miss Mayberry, and Clyde Rice, who I, you know, I never met half these people. I'd read about them in a book or in the magazines, you know, but so Clyde Rice had this horse, and we sold her for like 40000 to Merv Griffin, and she had a perfect heart on her head, like, I mean, perfect, yeah. unbelievable, like symmetric, and um, she ended up being okay. And then the next year, I bought another one with Jeannie. Uh, the first horse was by Mari's book. Cause, you know, so I learned a pedigree, you start looking it up. And then um, I had nothing to do with the process. I literally just like, okay, whatever. But I learned. And then um, the next year, we did it again. <clears throat> and um, Bob Levy, who was Mike Levy's father, they owned Atlantic City. They bought the horse out of the back ring. His name was Back Ring Al. I, I learned the process that way. And um, the Mayberries were good about teaching me things. Brian Mayberry passed away. He used to bring me the catalogs home. Uh, and I studied all the catalog pages and everything. So um, I applied to college. Um, but I went to a really good school in California, college prep school. And I wasn't going to go to college. You know, Bobby, my father was alive. And him and Bobby were sitting there and going, you don't need school. Why didn't you go to school for it? I said, yeah, OK, you're right. My mother found out and she said, you're going to college. I said, oh, okay. So um, I went to UK and uh, I'd never been to Kentucky before. My mother brought me back for, um, it was in June. We went to Dudley's, I visited the school and then I moved back August 15th, 1994. And then I would go back and forth. I worked on Judd Mott while I was in college. So each thing that happened was, uh, another step mm -hmm. towards where I was going. Yeah, it's picking up experience in different areas <clears throat> along the way. It's interesting. Everyone kind of has their own path, so it's interesting to hear that. Well, and, and you know, life is, is funny. You don't really, I look back and go, wow, if you would have scripted that, it couldn't happen. And my phone rings, you know, it was the phone in your dorm room. You had to go over. You with the cord? Yeah. Yep. Back in the um, day. I was in Kerwin Tower yeah. on UK's campus, and I had to I answer, and it was Garrett O'Rourke from Judmont. Wow. And he says, hey, we're told to get you out to the farm. So I kind of did a, a test program that was the, the basics of what became like the Kimi programs they have. Yeah. And so all these fillies that we work with on the track are now broodmares. And Tussaud was there and she had her first foal was you know, Mr. Prospector wow. called Chester House. And, and fast forward, I ended up working the stallion bar with them was basically the day the day was born. I was there the day he died. And, you know, how do you, and uh, so that was an interesting part. I always joke that I thought horses were born out of the back of a tech set an airplane <laughs> because, you know, we didn't have a bunch of mares and yeah, no breeding operation. Yeah. not in Arcadia. And, uh -huh. and I mean, they were in California, but I didn't really see it. Okay. So uh, this was a new experience for me. And I go home in the afternoon, you know, you had the little caller ID box, the yeah. old school one. Mm -hmm. And it said, John T.L. Jones calling me. I knew that name from all the magazines. Um, so I answered, and it was Johnny Jones. It was actually his son. And he said, you know, we need somebody in the office here. So I go down there, and I, I met him. And, and I said, OK. So I showed up on January 1st, and the office was, of course, closed. They didn't tell me that. <laughs> so anyway, when it opened, I, I went to work there. And for six months, I didn't really do anything because Johnny was not a great teacher, mm -hmm. but he was a good mentor. Okay. But not, he wouldn't really sit there and go, you should do this, this, and this. And Kerry Cawthon was in charge of the farm at that time, the business side. So uh, there's this other guy in there, he groaned at me every once in a while, and his name was Donato Lanny. Mm -hmm. So we, we were all there at, wow. at Walmack together. Wow. Donato and I are very good friends in, in the long run. And uh, we have a lot of stories we can't tell on this camera probably. But um, so from there, I had to figure out how I was going to get going. 
we go and I borrow some money and I bought some weanlings to pinhook. And I bought them by horses we had when I worked for Bobby. So they were by Missionary Ridge and Run Softly and Marketry. And one of them panned out to be a grade three winner. I'd sold them and made no money, but I had now at least something on my resume. Yes. And then it, it went from there and Mr. Moss, who my mother worked for, gave me a shot. Um, and we started buying horses and then it went from there. So what was your introduction to Ocala and spending a lot of time here? So I went in to bid on a horse by West by West, who was at Walmack. And um, Jeannie bought the horse for like 21000 I had twenty grand. She got it for twenty one. So we started talking, and I said, well, what are you doing? And so I, I came down here to visit um, Ocala, and I figured I needed a place to break horses. You know, I, I was studying, okay, how do I create this supply chain okay. for what I want to do? And so everybody said, you have to go to Ocala. I went and saw Jeannie, okay. and they were just getting started. Says, well, we'll have, I'll send a few. And so I kind of split the horses up. Um, my client, I think it was, and you know, we went from having five or ten of them in the beginning to, you know, the Mayberries will break have broke tons of horses. You know, this would be they're trying to keep it tight still yeah. and not let it get out of control. But we've gotten up to where we've had like 150 horses over there for for various clients. You know, so it went from this little thing and you know to 25 years later, <laughs> it's it's and and, and a lot of history, you know, historical horses have come off of their program. Um, you know, they, they don't get enough credit for what a great job they do, really and truly, because they're, they're horse first people. They're not big promoters. Um, you know, PETA, if they want to know how horse racing really is, they should go see it over there and get the truth about how well these horses are taken care of, not the, the negatives they put out there. I mean, they, they do a wonderful job, and, and the results are on a racetrack, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. So in your opinion, you, you're in, in all aspects of the sales industry all over the world, but what about two-year-old sales or buying a two-year-old at that point in their life specifically appeals to you, and what attributes do you, are you looking for to find success buying at a two-year-old sale? So the, the thing about the two-year-old sales, I'm a, I, I make a lot of analogies, so if we talk long enough, you're going to hear a bunch of them. Uh, <laughs> This is like a combine. So if you're trying to pick out the next Michael Jordan and you're, you're if you go by a, a weanling, it's like going to the hospital and saying, okay, there's a blue uh, blanket and a pink one and, and picking out the next great athlete from a bassinet. It's a lottery ticket, you know? So, and if you buy, you buy a yearling, it's a little bit more like getting somebody out of high school maybe. Now you come here, and this is like, okay, they've jumped through all these hoops. Um, you can look at their pedigrees. You can watch them physically perform, and you can get them down the stretch and see how they handle it. There's a mental aspect. You know, if these horses can't handle doing this, how are they going to handle going to the Breeders' Cup or the Derby or the ARC or, you know, Dubai, the World Cup or whatever other big races? How are they going to do that if we can't? they can't handle this pressure, which is pressure, but it's not, you know. So this gives you a little taste of that. Um, and then again, you know, you can, you can get the pedigree. Um, and there's something that people leave out when they talk about the two-year-old sales. The people that pick these horses, the men and women that are pin hookers, that buy these horses and bring them here to sell are some of the most accomplished horse people in our business. So they are doing a little bit of work for it. <laughs> they've gone through and they've found some diamonds in the rough, you know. But that, that's a big draw for me because it's something that I really respect and like about the two-year-old sales is these consigners, you know, overall are very, very cognizant of, of the repeat business and trying to keep this market, you know, bouncing along and where people can participate and come back. Well, that makes sense. So... Of, of all your experiences at OBS, what are some of your favorite memories or some of your favorite graduates that you can remember? <clears throat> you know, um, I went 
to work for Satish Sanan. He had bought some horses, and I got hired right before the April sale. He said, yeah, I bought a lot of horses already, but let's buy a couple more um, just because you're new on the team. I said, okay. So the second, we bought two. One was a total bust, and the other one was a horse called Majestic Perfection. And um, he ended up being, I think, a, a underrated, really good horse. And I thought this was my chance to own part of a Breeders' Cup horse. But that, that whole process, uh, George Sebo, who's no longer with us, always helped me. And, um, you know, if you, everybody knows George, he had a cigarette. David, there's a horse. I watched him prep breeze. You know, he had this gravelly <laughs> voice. And I said, okay, George, what is it? And he said, there's a Harlan's Holiday. It's up here. And it was all the way in the furthest barn, in the furthest stall. Um, I was in the 20s or something up there. So he breezes, and he breezed beautiful. And um, when he came out, he was a specimen. And <clears throat> he's kind of the prototype two-year-old. You A++ physical, uh, breezed beautiful, awesome mover. Maybe didn't have the best pedigree at the time. You know, it was a little bit of a, a wider page, but... That once they get here, you're you're buying an individual, you're buying an athlete, and he was the goods. I mean, he was, he was an awesome horse, and I think he sired two Oaks winners or something. You know, he ended up being a, a pretty good sire that you know they they don't think the market appreciated as much as I did. <laughs> yeah, of course. There's something we always say here that they can have a great breeze and uh, you have a great physical, and if they have don't have a lot of pedigree, we always say, well, they don't know what their pedigree looks like. They cannot run anything. So. I try not to teach ours to read because exactly. I don't want them to know that. You know? <laughs> yeah, don't want to know. So the next natural progression after buying a two-year-old is obviously to get them to the races. And so tell us a little bit about the, the partnership process and like your, how you curate an, an experience for your owners after you buy a two-year-old and to get them to the races. So we, we do, I work in two different ways. I have trainers I work for and I have owners I work for. Some of them are the same. Some of them are, are you know, I work for an owner and he has different trainers, or I work for a trainer owner team, you know. So I have individuals that want zero partners. They can afford to do this on their own. It's a family thing for them. They do it. And we try not to, you know, have everybody firing bullets at each other. We try to set the business up where it's got stratas. You know, and, and <clears throat> we're, it's January right now, so we're kind of getting all our orders together and figuring this out, what people want. So, you know, part of this process is we do buy a lot of yearlings. And I'm going through and we're grading all of the yearlings, now turned two-year-olds. Um, market is, is tough to buy, you know, especially at the what's perceived to be the better quality. So we, you know, we have positions to fill, if you will, on the team. So it's looking at what we have and then talking to the owners about what we need in their in the scope of their their plan, you know, for their team. So the the owners that are sort of individuals, it's pretty straightforward. Then I like owning horses at the racetrack myself. Um, I'm dumb enough to believe that I can actually pick one out and own it and beat everybody else. But which we've done pretty decent at. I, I'm proud of that fact. I own silks, and uh, I, I like running them. But I want to play at the big league. I have a cap on what I can spend myself. So what we'll typically do is set up some kind of partnership. Um, and it's very fair and equitable, and um, try to build a, a team of people, you know, not where you have – the micro shares, which I'm not knocking, but that's a little bigger thing than I'm interested in. But we'll we'll have different groups that it could be three guys from college, at, you know, yeah. it can be um, some ladies that all you know golf together, whatever, you know, wh whatever the composite is. We'll put people together and try to put like-minded people together. The trainers I work with are very very talented. They work very very hard. But we, we try to curate these partnerships with people that are like-minded that, you know, have the means to do this. But you buy one horse for $300,000, you have one shot. We know that the process, you know, to, to get to where you want to go, it takes, takes numbers. So we'll try to get four or five in a partnership or ten horses and have everybody own a piece. And that's the team. 
And then um, we're trying to make it fun for them. So while we're down here, like this week, and we've got a lot of people coming in to look at horses that we bought already that they own part of, um, and kind of talking about what we're going to do at the two-year-old sales, how we're going to fill it in. Like <clears throat> this particular group, you know, our goal is get 20 total. So we've got 16, and we need four more, and we need Colts. So that's going to be the plan. It's pretty simple. Our whole goal is for the people that get involved in racing, whether it's a, a family that wants to do it as a family or in a partnership scenario, is to give them the whole experience. Most people can go buy like their boat or their place in the Hamptons or go on vacation in Africa what, that are doing this. If you're doing this, you have a choice to do it. You're choosing to spend a lot of money and be disappointed about 80% of the time because, you know, the best people are around 20%. Yes. And, um, but so how do you keep it fun when 80% of the time you're losing? <laughs> and, and it's through the experience. And we, we try to educate people. We try to, you know, no question is too insignificant. Um, we try to make time for people. We try to communicate on a regular basis. We have a lot of retained partners. We're in our fifth partnership that we do. Um, and, and this is, you know, like my first person in the partnership is always me. And then we build it from there. Um, you know, we have the West Points we work with. Um, they're a big patron of, of mine and my family's. And we do a lot at Lane's End with them, you know, with the flight line connection. Yes, um, we've got an OBS sale grad called Signature that we own. That was uh, top 12 on the Derby dozen list the other day. So, you know, we're, we're all in with, with the two-year-old sales. Yeah, of course. Well, it's an exciting time of year. You mentioned the, you know, the two-year-old sales season coming up and the, the Derby dozen list coming out. It's, it's an exciting time to be involved in, in racing and sales especially. So you mentioned some of the goals for your partnership, but what about you personally? What about your professional goals? You've been involved, personally involved with some of the greatest thoroughbreds in my lifetime, some, some would say of all time. And what, what is the goal that you would like to see yourself accomplish that you haven't accomplished yet? You know, I, I've been uh, woefully inept at the classics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've led as a, as a participant involved in like, Honor AP was one of the best horses I feel we've ever had, talent-wise. He got knocked out at the start. Um, ended up getting a career-ending injury to his tendon at the break, but still ran fourth. There's no doubt in my mind he would have won with a clean trip. And then the next year, um, I actually owned part of Rock Your World, and he was, you know, second choice, undefeated out of Sandia Derby. You know, the start got him. Like, the me and the start at the Derby with stuff I'm involved with has not been a real positive. Um, so... You know, the one year I, I worked for Ahmed Zayat, and we were second with Bodie Meister in the Derby, second um, in the Preakness with Bodie Meister, and second in the Belmont with Painter. And I was actually underbid on Trini Berg, who that year set the pace, the fastest pace they've ever had, and I bid 20 grand on them for a Korean client. And, you know, they had that limit of 20,000, and somebody bid 21. I always wonder if that horse had gone to Korea, if Bodie Meister might have won the Derby. So I haven't had a great record in there, but it hasn't really been what we focused on. So I can't be too hard on myself, but it's something I'd like to, to get a winner of. My mother and stepfather point out that they've won the Derby and I haven't. So, um, yeah, well, <laughs> we're very competitive. I like it. I like it. Um, you know, the, the Mayberry's trained an Oaks winner for Mr. Moss. So they, Jerry Moss, one of the few people that's won both. So, uh, but I'd like to, I'd like to get a little more active on the Triple Crown Trail in the future, um, but as my backup prize is the Breeders' Cups, I'll take it. You know, so a good, a good consolation. Yeah, so, but no, I I need to bulk that up. My man Donato, he does better in there than I do with with Baffer, but we we got to work on that. Um, you know, just keep bringing people in and into the game, giving them a good experience. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of changes in our industry that are, are positive. I think some of them are not as practical as they need to be. So, you know, I'm on the HISA advisory board. One thing I feel like 
I have a voice and I'm lucky to be in some positions because we have experience in matters. And so talking that through with the people that are making these rules mm -hmm. and telling them the practical side of it, yes. I, I think something I, my wife looks at me and goes, David, this is, she trains horses and she's on the front lines dealing with these things. Mm -hmm. She's like, nobody's going to listen. And I'm like, no, I, I believe they will. And I'm not afraid to complain and open my mouth and, you know, say stuff. But if you're going to say something and you have a chance to make change, you need to do it. So I'm hoping that's a goal for this year is to maybe help Heisa, which I think is necessary and important, um, be more practical and not punish some of the people that do a good job, you know, that, that already keep these high standards. Um, so that's something I'm, I'm interested in. And, you know, just keep, like I say, keep going to get, we have an awesome, awesome, awesome sport. The high of winning a race is addictive. I mean, winning a race, it is such a feeling. And if you could can that and bottle it um, and sell it, we would not have a drug problem in America. <laughs> you know, we, we would, it's just so, I mean, if it's a $10,000 claimer, mm -hmm or the Derby, mm -hmm. or the Breeders' Cup. I can honestly tell you, like, flight line winning is amazing, but then you have your own horse win two races later, some allowance race, you're still pretty jacked up about it. So I think getting more people exposed to that and the lifestyle that we have and, and getting one message out that I, I think we've done a bad job as an industry, we treat these horses very, very, very well. Anybody comes to my wife's barn, John Sheriff's barn, John Sadler's barn, Suge McGahee, you name it, the, the people, they're going to see horses treated right. But see people treated right. I, I think we don't do a, a great job of promoting how well these horses are taken care of. I think our aftercare has really bolstered up, mm -hmm. at least in our lifetimes. Absolutely. It's really different and better. And... Um, so those are things that, you know, we need to take the narrative and turn it around. And I don't think we get credit for, as an industry, how well we do taking care of the equine athletes when their careers are over. What do you like specifically about shopping at OBS? What I love about OBS is it's, it's owned by the participants. So I feel like um, how they present the horses, how the sale is run, how the management treats uh, – myself and my clientele as as the customer is so much better than than some other places and you know we touched on ethics and and you know highs and different things the rules here the the testing i feel very comfortable when i buy a horse i just have a comfort level buying at obs that i feel like the product i'm getting is the product was presented to me um and and those are not rules they these are obs rules mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've talked to different management here over the years, and the integrity of the testing and the product is so high. And then the, just the experience. I mean, the auctioneers are great. They're, they're good guys. They joke around with you. Um, all the staff is friendly. They really go out of their way to help you, you know, with your accommodations. Um, and, and it's a good surface. I like, I like horses. They come out of here pretty well. Um, it's a great place to go. I mean, Ocala is, when I came here 25 years ago, the Ocala I came to is not this one. David, thank you for joining us here at OBS. Appreciate the discussion, and I uh, look forward to seeing you here back for, yeah. for the studio. See, see you in March. See you in March. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank great you.